professor of zoology. We have never had a, a visit by a zoologist before. Um, he did his bachelor's in psychology and his PhD in psychology and genetics. Um, and his dissertation was on the mating behavior of fruit flies. Um, in the years since then, he has ranged far and wide uh, from chemo sensing in the animal world to the history of genetics to real history, the history of the French resistance, I was amazed to see. Um, we are very, very glad to have this Renaissance man with us this afternoon, which happens to be this evening his time. Uh, so extra, extra thanks to Matthew for staying up late for us. Um, we, we hope we can host you in person someday. Um, Matthew's book uh, brings together some history, a little sociology, a lot of science, and the kind of perspective that comes from having a grasp of all of these different disciplines. Um, if you're interested in neuroscience, whether you are a true believer or a committed skeptic, and I know we have uh, some of both camps, um, as well as the very reasonable <laughs> middle um, in this audience, um, you will find the perspective of this book and hopefully, you know, we'll hear from Matthew. Um, it will be stimulating and enlightening. So Matthew tells me he will speak for just 10 or 15 minutes. Um, and then we are going to take your questions. It's going to be very interactive. Um, as we did with the previous book clubs, we are going to ask you to type your questions into the chat section of the Zoom, uh, the Zoom platform. Um, that way, you know, everybody can see your questions. I mean, if you want, you can just direct your question to me and Natalie, but I think, um, you know, just type your questions in there. Natalie and I will do our best to sort of keep up with the flow of questions and hopefully, you know, pass them on to Matthew in some kind of semi-organized order. Um, dog just stole my uh, <laughs> microphone. But I think that's everything we need to get out of the way before we can hear from Matthew. So thank you, Matthew. Okay, thank you. Um, and first of all, yeah, I mean, <laughs> this is uh, saying before we started that uh, of the many things I thought might happen as a consequence of publishing this book, this is probably the last one. Uh, and it's an incredible privilege uh, that many of you have not only been reading the book, which is great, but actually sitting around and discussing and arguing about its ideas. So uh, a tremendous thank you to you and uh, the Centre for the invitation, because this is quite extraordinary. It's exactly, well, yes, it's beyond my wildest dreams, uh, this. Okay, so I'm, I'm not going to repeat the, the key arguments about the book, because you've either read it or... You, I hope you'll be enticed enough uh, to read it. Uh, I'll, what I'm going to do is give you an outline of how I came to write it and why I came to write it and my kind of the process involved because that's often quite opaque to uh, people, in, in particular, in fact, to scientists because most scientists, of course, don't write books. Uh, we used to centuries ago, uh, but now we produce papers. And so the, the production of a book, and even more a, a book that's not intended as an academic monograph, uh, although I'm very, very pleased you all read it, it was intended to be for the uh, interested layperson, but then that includes uh, a lot of neuroscientists as well, because not everything, it's very difficult to, to master all, all the areas uh, to do with the, the brain. So uh, I thought I'd explain that and then I'm going to show you there's a number of videos which are partly relate to things that are in the book that I want to show you, just brief clips that you may have been interested in and then I'll finish off with the kind of close that I normally have uh, when I give a talk around the book to explain where we're going and then we can argue or talk or whatever. 
So uh, I'm somebody who's already been explained, is interested in the science and in the history of science. This is something, um, I mean, I, I think I've always been interested in and uh, I've now got the, the position at a suitable seniority when I can, we can, I can do it and I don't get too much pestered by my, uh, by my bosses because they're kind of accepted. Uh, the, the mishmash of stuff uh, that, that I do. Um, and in, in 2015, I published a book called Life's Greatest Secret, which was uh, subtitled The Race to Crack the Genetic Code. So it's basically a, a history of the uh, molecular, early years of molecular genetics from the 1940s through to the 1960s when the genetic code was entirely uh, resolved. And then a a subsequent chapter section, not half the book, but a, a good third of it was bringing the story uh, of our understanding of molecular genetics up, up to date. You may recognize something about the structure uh, with the current book. And after finishing that, and that was finished in kind of late 2014, I got discussing with my editor uh, at the, uh, the what's called a trade press. So this is a commercial publisher. It's not a university press uh, in the US. It's published by, both books were published by Basic, um, which is you know, a very good, but commercial press. And the same thing in the UK, the publishers were Profile, which is one of the leading independent uh, publishers. Um, my editor then, uh, John Davey, who subsequently died very sadly, he suggested to me, well, you know, because we, got talking about well, what's the next book going to be about because one of the things about writing a, a a book it's not like when you finish your phd when you finish your phd it's a, it's a massive anti-climax well i found it to be so uh, that you just think you're exhausted and you know you've really kind of got into the detail of this thing and you may even hate it and never want to see it again uh, i find with writing books it's it's rather the opposite um because they're a different kind of writing you end up with this godlike mastery of whatever topic you've engaged in and then actually I, I find myself quite addicted I want to do well what's the next one I've got to try and keep that high of writing as clearly as I can and uh, mastering a particular topic for the general public so John suggested I'm pretty certain it was him who suggested well why don't you write a book about the brain and uh as uh, Martha said, I've got a, a, my first degree was in psychology. Back, in, I mean, it was a long time ago, especially the, the younger people here. This is when the world was in, not only in black and white, but even more shocking, there was no Wi-Fi. Uh, and neuroscience barely existed as a word, never mind as a topic. There were no neuroscience degrees anywhere. So the psychology that I did was the psychology um, that involved both um, uh, David Ma, so we had people who are very interested in his theories of vision, uh, but also people who are very interested in Freud. So I had lectures on Freud as well as on, on Ma. So it was a real kind of mixture uh, of, of things, but it also had people who were working on Drosophila behavior genetics, which is how I ended up doing that topic for my, my PhD in, in, in Sheffield at the University of Manchester. So I was a bit taken back by this idea, but I said, okay, right, let's, uh, it seemed to me rather ambitious and the initial plan, which was still good enough to sell the book, was, to be honest, pretty awful. Uh, it was dull and was basically more a history of neuroscience. And I, this, this was in 2015, I started writing and it, it, it was very, very hard going. And I wasn't very happy with what I was producing. But I gradually realized as I was writing uh, these earlier chapters, because I began at the beginning and carried, kind of carried on and there's a chronological structure, um, that in fact there was this this business of metaphor was actually really quite significant and that was something that had actually been present in the book about genetics as well focusing on the the idea of information and code and these are aren't actual things they're metaphors that we use to understand what's in genes for example and this really grew stronger as I I, I began to think about what the book was looking like and why it wasn't very good at the time and why I wasn't happy with it, let's put it that way. Um, and I realized that the, the significance of technical, technological metaphors for how the, what the brain is, how it works, that was really the thread that I wanted to kind of orient 
the writing about. So that didn't particularly involve a massive change because this was, I was about two or three chapters in and so most of the stuff hadn't been written yet, but it did change the plan. Uh, and my, my editor who took over when John died, Ed Lake, was uh, very, very pleased with that. He wasn't so pleased because about kind of, I would, would send him chapters as I finished them, which took, took a long time for various reasons. Um, and he got rather cross, we didn't get cross with me. He said, well, look, you keep on saying that we don't know, but how does the brain work? And I said to him, well, I really don't know, Ed. I'm sorry, I can't, can't help you there. Uh, it's not my fault. Uh, and he was a bit taken aback by that. And he said, well, look, we've got to have an explanation. Every book about the brain has, you know, the brain works in this way, or this is the great theory that's going to explain it. I said, look, when you go to conferences, when people sit around and talk, yes, we know basically the kind of things the brain does, but to really understand what's going on, people, you know, they will sit around in the conference bar in the evening and say, well, we really don't know very much, do we? So I kind of convinced him that I was allowed to say that, well, really, you know, the, the, the USP of the, of the book is that we, we don't know what the brain does, unlike most books, which generally make some claim or another. Uh, as I say, it took a lot more, a lot longer than I intended, partly because it kind of grew and grew and ended up very, very long and baggy. Um, and the first kind of draft I, I submitted to, to Ed was about 140,000 words. And this made him a bit annoyed because it was, because with a commercial publisher, they've got a particular kind of price point they think the book is got to be aimed at, an audience. Uh, and this would, if it was so long, that would make it uh, the price of the book simply because of the amount of paper in it. You know, it's stuff like that you never really think about. That would have made it too expensive and would have kind of priced the book out of the market. Furthermore, I produced it at the wrong time of year. And you're going to say, well, what? that sounds crazy. Well, you've got to remember, commercial publishing is based around what they can sell when. And in the UK, at least, every book, basically, from September to December is based on the Christmas market. So that involves things like celebrity memoirs, um, cooking books, you know, stuff that I, I could not compete with. You know, in, in, in the bookstores, my book would just be swamped by this you know, wave of stuff that we buy to give to other people at Christmas. So they didn't want to produce it in autumn. And it takes, for some reason, despite the fact that, you know, it's all done electronically, it takes nine months, basically, from the moment you submit the manuscript to the book appearing. It's like having a baby. So I ended up with about six or eight months of just dead air when I finished the manuscript and they didn't want to publish it. We had a few arguments about this had arguments about the length but of course as we all know with publishers uh, with editors they are right so what happened was that I had kind of eight months one with Ed saying look you've got to chop 25,000 words out of it which I could do I just had to rewrite it and rewrite it and rewrite it and I think one of the reasons why it's had such a good response is that it is in fact much got much more rewriting in it than I would normally do and if I'd you know, hit, been got lucky and got it at the right uh, date, uh, you know, kind of uh, June rather than whenever it was the beginning of the year, um, then we would have published earlier and it all would have been probably not so well written or not so well edited. So the editing was mainly me, but to the younger uh, listeners, that is the essence to writing. It's rewriting. It's going over it. It's killing your darlings, getting rid of those bits you really, really like. There were huge, great big bits at the beginning that, that, that you know, the opening chapter was initially uh, two, and there was lots of discussion about anthropology and Carlos Castaneda and all sorts of stuff, which was great fun, but really wasn't to the point. So the rewriting really, really helped, I think, and getting it down to around about 120,000 words. And then, of course, it appeared right at the beginning of lockdown uh, in the UK. So uh, I had one, I had two events to launch it. There was a, a reading I did in uh, and a chat with a, a colleague in a local Manchester bookstore. And then I did a, an event at the Royal Institution in London. And that's a, a really big deal uh, with my good friend, Adam Rutherford, who's a, a, a very well-known science journalist in the UK. Uh, and then lockdown happened and, and Adam got terribly, terribly ill with COVID. I was very lucky uh, not to catch it off him. 
so I assumed that the book would then die uh, because, you know, nobody's buying books and bookshops shops are all shut. In fact, in the UK anyway, and I think okay, as well in the US, bookshop, books have been a final refuge for people. So there's been a lot of reading going on, a lot of buying. So that's all been good. Um, and the best news is that there's this big uh, award in the UK called the uh, Bailey Gifford. It's not quite the Pulitzers, um, but it's still pretty good. Uh, and the book's been shortlisted for that, and we'll find out in a, in a month uh, if, if I've won. So that's a tremendous kind of uh, accolade, which I'm very, very proud about. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is just to show you some things that you couldn't see because it's not an e well, it's an e-book, but it's not a, you know, a hyper book. Um, one of the things that I mentioned in passing was the, the, the use of, and fits in with the ideas about technology, was the use of clockwork and the ideas of machine man um, from La Metrie and others uh, in the 18th century. I just want to show you this little video. So this is an automaton. Now, nobody thought this was alive or that it was thinking, but it still is quite remarkable. Uh, and it's made by the Swiss matchmaker Pierre Jacquet Dros. And if you, when you can travel again, you can go to Neuchâtel in uh, Switzerland uh, and you can actually see this thing uh, working. And what it does is to write, and it's in fact, it's programmable. So you can make it write literally different letters, both different letters, but also write a different letter. So let's, um, here we go. I'm gonna see it uh, moving. That's absolutely astonishing. And we'll see in a sec if it doesn't freeze. Look at its eyes flicking, that's creepy. <laughs> so, I mean, the, the whole thing is absolutely extraordinary. So this shows you that there was plenty of reason for people to think that, well, okay, this thing isn't alive, but it, it looks remarkably like it's alive. So just like Descartes watched his um, uh, hydraulic powered statues in the French parks in the 17th century, in the 18th century, growing technology, I mean, it really did suggest that there might be some strictly mechanical basis to uh, thought, to behavior, as you can see from this uh, device. The next thing I want to show you is Locker's Ladybird, because in the, in the book it's reduced to a, a description, and uh, I was actually able to get one. Um, is it up here? Hang on a sec, I will come back. Here we are. This is it, and uh, when I did my one real-time talk at the Royal Institution, I actually got it out and um, we had it uh, making a big noise. So one of the reasons I don't do that online is it keeps on making a noise. So I've actually got one of these things, um, which is made in the uh, Czech Republic, but it's exactly the same as the one that Locker saw. Locker is a, was a theoretical ecologist, so he's not somebody you'd really imagine would be interested in this kind of thing. But he saw this little mechanical device and this is what he saw it do. So this is a video I made earlier, um, and we'll watch what it does. So as soon as it gets to the edge, it's turning round. And this is from the, from the 1920s. So this is a, you know, this is a vintage, you know, it's a replica toy, um, but it's doing exactly the same thing. And of course there's nothing in here that is electronic there's no sensor there's nothing beyond some very very simple uh, mechanics which Lotka was quite amazed by um, and so was I when I actually <laughs> I decided I'd, I'd get one and see whether it really really works and it is quite extraordinary so this is the this is Lotka's description of it and basically it works by you've got this driving wheel here which is what was pushing the thing along and its antennae are keeping it keeping it this its head up and in particular this thing here which is a sideways view of a freewheel so you can see it here this thing here it moves doesn't it's not powered at all so normally the thing goes forward because that's what its power is making it do but as soon as the antennae fall off the edge then this this freewheel which is in fact set at a slight angle then touches the ground yeah because this falls down so this falls down and turns it away so what Locker was doing was looking at these purely mechanical parts and he was actually trying to imagine it as a whole 
and he's what he says is that the the toy construes the information the whole thing is construing information a very strange kind of word it's it's integrating it it's working and clearly it's been designed and uh actual organisms haven't been designed they're they're adapted or they've kind of stuck together from all sorts of bits but he's arguing that information is being construed by this whole device and i thought that was quite an extraordinary insight uh on his part and i thought it was also that when you actually see it happening you can see quite how astonishing it is with no no electronics no nothing just a, a few bits of mechanics another example uh which again i talked about briefly in the book be good to to see this is um from a newsreel so uh, young people these were films that were shown before the the film when you went to the cinema uh, before the main movie you'd have a, a newsreel which would tell you what was happening in the world and this is from path Bay, which is one of the main uk ones and it's a, an excerpt from uh, about 1951 and gray walter uh, was a psychologist in um bristol and he made uh, a tortoise well it wasn't a tortoise it's a little device and it's all working by um positive and negative feedback uh, but the, uh, the the video is quite striking uh, you probably won't if you're English you'll be able to or British you'll, you'll sense the accent of the, the person who's doing the reading uh, if you're not you might not get it but this is a very very posh upper class accent who's uh, describing uh, Grey Walter's Toby. Now meet Dr Grey Walter of Bristol. Why the torch? Well here's the reason. It's Toby a mechanical tortoise with an electronic brain which functions like the human mind. Toby's head, or rather magic eye, is a photoelectric cell constantly revolving until it picks up the strongest source of light, to which it is then attracted. In this case, an ordinary electric torch guides the mechanical tortoise in any direction its inventor chooses. It can also negotiate obstacles. When it hits an object, the pressure on the shell causes a short circuit of the photoelectric cell mechanism and the tortoise moves at random until it is free of the obstacle. Now this, uh, in fact, if you go to the Science Museum in London, they've got this device um, in, a, in a clear uh, plexiglass shell so you can see all the, the, the innards and how it worked. In fact, it was even more amazing, uh, the whole video shows that uh, Toby, if when he gets tired, when his battery runs down, he knows to go back to a hutch. There was a, a, a little hutch. I don't know if I can, let's scroll it back. Yeah, there you go. See, that's his hutch. Uh, and Toby gets uh, recharged in there. So he go back when he gets tired. He goes back in there and can plug himself in and recharge his batteries. So what what Walter was doing was using some very simple principles much as uh, Lotka had been able to perceive, uh, was using some very simple principles to make a device that has the appearance of being alive. It's doing a lot of the things that, you know, if you gave a, uh, a first year student, define me life, they'd come up with many of the things. It's moving purposefully, it can, it can uh, regenerate, it can get energy uh, from the external environment and so on. Clearly it's not alive and it's not thinking despite <laughs> the fact that they suggest it uses the, it functions along the same basis as the the human mind it, it clearly doesn't but you've got a an attempt to use technology not to as a, as a way of getting insight perhaps into how the brain and behavior brain might work and how behavior might emerge um, I just want to show you this as well because this came out uh, subsequent to the book being published one of the things I mentioned in the book is and you all know this is quite how mind-bogglingly complicated synapses are uh, and they have dozens of a single synapse can have dozens of different neurotransmitters it can some of them activating some of them inhibiting inhibiting and this amazing figure of five and a half thousand different proteins uh, in a human synapse which I mean they're not all function to do with the function some of them will be structural but there's an awful lot of them and there's this video that came out from based on a paper in eLife uh, about six months ago and I just had to have it and I use it in my talks now and it shows what I think 40 or so of these uh, 
proteins are actually doing. So just 40 of the five and a half thousand. Yeah, 45 different proteins. So this is a paper, it's an EMBO journal, it wasn't any life there, I've got it all wrong. So look at the time, it's, 50, it's, it's in milliseconds. So this is really slowed down what we're gonna see, but it just gives us some idea of the fact that this isn't a, a, a digital all or nothing. This is really chaotic as you'd expect, because you know, it's about life. So it's very, very hard to follow what's going on there, but they actually tracked them. And you can see this is, uh, look at the time in milliseconds. I mean, this is all really, really quick. And this is obviously happening all the time in our synapses, buzzing around this chaotic confusion of uh, proteins and stuff moving around, altering how we behave. Final thing I'm going to, a final couple of things I'm going to show you is firstly to, I mentioned this uh, in, in, in the book, uh, Jeffrey Hinton's work where they gave one of their deep learning programs uh, hours and hours of uh, YouTube videos, in fact, just a data stream, of course, uh, of YouTube videos, stills from YouTube videos, and the machine ended up with a cat detector. And this is the image from the paper, which I refer to in the book. We didn't put it in because it would be hard for people to not think it was a printing error. But if you look at it, you can, in fact, see a cat. This is the, the, the kind of unit of the program, the essence of catness that this deep learning program extracted from just hours and hours of zeros and ones, because that's all it could really see was zeros and ones in the uh, YouTube stream. And uh, there you go. You can see it. It's got eyes, ears, mouth. It's a bit like the Cheshire cat is fading away. And of course, the essence, though this is very impressive, you've got to remember, uh, and this is Hinton's point, uh, he's at interviewed and he says a separate problem. The interviewer says, we don't really entirely know how these things work, these things being Hinton's program. And he's very upfront. Yeah, we really don't know how they work. So this was, I, I, I use this as a, a way of kind of to, calm the excitement of those who are understandably excited by uh, deep learning, which is extraordinary. But as an ex explanation of what's going on, it's very, very hard to see how we could take that and apply it to the brain. Final example I'm going to give is not actually from my work. I'm going to big up somebody else's book, Janelle Shane. Uh, she's an AI researcher. This very, very funny book, You Look Like a Thing and I Love You. And she's been using GPT-2, and that's the uh, program that, a neural net that can write articles. It wrote a New Yorker article, uh, and it's recently been su superseded by GPT-3, um, which uh, she uses to, I mean, it was recently used to, they wrote a Guardian article based on it as well. So these are very, very clever neural nets that have basically read I think the GP2 was programmed, was trained on fan fiction. So it's read all that awful fan fiction that many of the younger people won't, uh, won't admit to reading. And then uses that to produce things in very, very good English, but which are always a bit weird. Uh, and that's one of Shane's great points is that she's always happy to have fun. And one of the things she did was to say, okay, GP22, you're very smart, you can write a New Yorker article, write me some candy hearts, which of course at one level is trivial because candy hearts just have one or two words on them, that's all. So it should be okay, yeah? Well, let's see what it did. That's what we got, she got out of it. <laughs> uh, now, whilst, I don't know, fart booby, um, or T-Rex or the one about ants. Ants can stay. I mean, I'd, I'd eat all them, but you can see that the problem here is the AI doesn't have the foggiest idea about what uh, a, a candy heart should have. It knows it should have a short slogan, but what that should be, it really can't understand. So although it's seen lots of these things, you know, I love you, be mine, and all the rest of that stuff you have on them, uh, when it's actually given the task of writing them, it can only come up with uh, very amusing, uh, but nonsense, because it doesn't understand context. And that is the key thing that no matter how smart these programs are, they don't really understand what's going on. Just as Hinton's cat program has no idea about what a cat is, it's never seen a cat, all it's seen is zeros and ones, and it can see patterns. Uh, this AI has no idea what love is, doesn't know what a heart is, doesn't know what a, a candy heart is. 
Okay, so to, to, to finish, uh, and the, this is the last couple of slides that I normally give in my talk. What my, the theme of my book is the intertwining of science, culture, and technology, and how culture and technology affect what we think about science and the, the ideas we can have. They provide us with metaphors for discovery. This is in particular uh, the case in, in biology, I think, and not just in neuroscience. As I say, this was one of the themes of my uh, book on, on genetics. Uh, I think probably in most aspects of uh, science, apart from maths and physics, which literally have another language, we need metaphors to frame what we're doing. And they often come from technology. But those metaphors, which are incredibly powerful, like all models, because that's really what it is, it's kind of a very simplistic model, they're also limited because they're not the thing itself. They're a metaphor for it. And therefore, as I say rather cutely, a, a framework, which is fantastic, can also be a cage. It can stop you thinking things. Now, we know that new technological developments will alter how we can imagine what the brain does. So our current understanding will be enriched in the future. It's not going to destroy certain facts or interpretations, but it will enrich them. It will change them. And often when I talk to uh, neuroscientists about this, then they, they get very excited because they realize this is true. And then they then want to know what the next big thing is going to be. Um, and I normally say, well, you know, I don't know, because and if I knew I'd be very rich, which I'm not. Uh, but I've recently developed a future armor device, which enables me to peer into the future. So we're going to see, I'm going to turn it on and just click here and here, and we're going to see the image of the future that will tell us what these new technological developments are going to be and give us an insight into the new metaphors. Damn it, it's broken again. Okay, well, you're going to have to work that out for yourselves, I'm afraid. Okay, right, that's it, thank you. Um, I think we can stop sharing now. Um, and uh, I'll, I can see you all because I, I hid myself. So, so I'm happy to uh, take questions now. That went on a bit longer than I thought it was going to be. Well, it always does. Sorry. Wow, that was wonderful. So, folks, um, you know, it's it's a bummer that uh, for some reason the future ama <laughs> didn't work, but. What, uh, what, else would you like to, <laughs> what else? How would you long like it to... took me? It, how long it took me to find that on YouTube? There are whole <laughs> YouTube channels devoted to static, and none of them look right. I had to find one that looked right. Ah, oh, right, 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 right. I mean, I remember the days when the vertical hold, you know, on the television didn't work, and but we don't we don't see those anymore. Folks, uh, please do uh, come. Come forward with your questions and comments. Um, ah. Questions, or even you know, I, this is what I really liked about your uh, your book. I mean, I remember uh, Rob DeRubis, who's on this call, who is um, a clinical psychologist who's done um, a lot of clinical trials comparing CBT to antidepressants. Um, and, uh, you know, he said, I think he really, he, he gets it right with, you know, the sort of, um, strengths and shortcomings of, uh, antidepressants. Rob, do you want to elaborate? Sorry, I'm putting you on the spot, but I want somebody to be talking. <laughs> yeah, no, I, as, as I said in the, the two weeks back, um, while I was uh, reading your chapter, it was filled with things that I was familiar with and things that were extensions of, of those that I was familiar with. And the perspective I thought was right on because it was very similar to mine. Um, okay. and, uh, <laughs> That's always good. Much better informed uh, really, and in the sense that, that really the, the, the detail that you gave to the progression or maybe progression isn't quite the word, but the history of our attempt to understand neuro neurochemistry by observing, you know, the effects of pharmaceuticals, particularly on individuals uh, uh, whose brains weren't uh, uh, functioning efficiently, you know. And um, no, I, I thought it was a, 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 I will assign it to students who need to understand um, 
where we have been and, and where we are. And uh, of course, where we're going is yeah. a tough one because as I said that time, uh, uh, there's little investment now in uh, advancing any possibility of new compounds based on uh, perhaps better understandings of uh, uh, neurotransmission. And so uh, this, this is something that's, uh, there really has been a, a lull in this because of those things that you spelled out, which was that the medicines for, for mental uh, difficulties have been discovered by accident, have, and then uh, at a certain point, uh, the accidental discoveries have uh, kind of dried up, except for um, the one, uh, which is the horse tranquilizer, which we can talk about. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'll stop there, but uh, no. Yeah, I mean, that was, so I, I was very wary. I mean, when you're writing uh, outside of your area of expertise, and this is outside of my area of expertise, um, I, uh, you have to be very careful because uh, on, the, on the one hand, you know, I'm not any kind of physician or clinician, uh, and so I included a very clear footnote saying, you know, if you're, if you're concerned, do not stop taking your meds because of what anything I've said, you know, go and talk to your physician. I think that's incredibly important. Uh, and there's been a lot of argument in the UK where maybe the debate has been more uh, vicious uh, between uh, critics of uh, SSRIs in particular and those who uh, argue that this is the, the, the best treatment we've got. And I was trying to navigate between those two views whilst at the same time, you know, I, I think the fact, as you say, that the, all of the big pharma companies have shut down their, uh, their programs. I mean, I, I, I knew about some, I thought, is it, can this really be true? I read Nicholas's Rose, Nicholas Rose, he's a, a UK uh, kind of sociologist of medicine. And he had a, a book which was you know, deeply depressing in that respect, because we all imagine, uh, you know, I mean, I had this in, in my family and I, I found myself saying to the, saying to the, the physicians, uh, you know, and they, they said, well, what do you really want out of this? I said, I want you, I want you to give a pill to make it go away, you know. Um, and of course, that doesn't work generally, uh, even if uh, certain medications can alleviate some symptoms. With, I guess, the exception in particular of lithium. Uh, which uh, has remarkable effects. But what was striking was that every time, you know, the, the, there was these cycles of boom and bust, we think, right, okay, we've got it now, we can really solve this. And then it, uh, the drug turns out to have horrible side effects or only a subpopulation is uh, really supported and really helped by the drugs. Um, but again, I thought that was um, significant in that uh, the, the issue of, you know, in a way, medicine's a bit different from, from science. If science, you want to know how it works, but in medicine, and that certainly would be my point of view for any treatment, as long as it does work and it's safe, I'll take it, you know. Uh, and knowing exactly how it works, and I guess this is going to be the case with any, including with, you know, CBT or other treatments. We, you know, we know it works for some people, but exactly the processes that are going on are a matter of debate. There is, there's some questions here that I, I, I could answer. Um, Go for it. If you, if you can in the, uh, in the chat. Well, this is multitask other, and answer. Yeah, that, that's fine. I'm used to doing yeah. that. Um, Great. So uh, Henri Maillardet's Automatron is at the Franklin Institute, for those of you in Philly. Well, I don't know that, but I'm sure it's fantastic. So go and see that um, when, if the museums are open. Uh, yeah, Michael Ruse's Mystery of Mysteries. Um, I haven't read that book of Ruse's. Uh, Ruth wants to know whether you should read Janelle Shane's book or mine. Well, I'll be absolutely honest. It depends what you're interested in. If you're interested in AI and the power and the limits of it, uh, then I'd, I'd read hers, <laughs> you know, to be absolutely honest, because, you know, she's an actual practitioner, plus it is very funny. I mean, my book's funny occasionally, but her book is systematically funny. Um, uh, but if you want to know about the brain, then you should read mine. Um, Pete wants to know, are we three or 300,000 Einsteins away from understanding consciousness? Oh, crikey. So I often surprise people by saying, I'm not actually very interested in consciousness. <laughs> because I'm a, you know, I, I poke maggots. That's my job. Uh, and that's clear in the, in, in, the, in the final bit of the book is that, you know, for somebody who's interested in 
and has ha a hard time understanding how neurons represent the, a single neuron represents the outside world. That's my challenge. Um, and as I said, with the, the work of Ruth Marder, of Eve Marder, sorry, uh, Eve Marder with her uh, 30 cells in the lobster's stomach that we don't understand, then the idea that, you know, well, what about consciousness? Um, so, I mean, I remember as an undergraduate in the mid, mid late 1970s, you know, we sat around in the coffee room and we said, so how does consciousness work? And of course, we're all psychologists, you know. And then we all agreed that it was some kind of epiphenomenon produced by a certain amount of neural activity. And then we moved on because <laughs> uh, we knew we couldn't get at it. So we just assumed that was going to be all that was really uh, could be done. And clearly in the last 20, 30 years, largely, I think, through the initial drive of Francis Crick, people have got a lot more interested in it. My, my own view is that I still think that it is beyond understanding consciousness is centuries away. Maybe what Crick argued about finding neural correlates of consciousness, that is more possible. And I think there's a, a I argue this in the book, that maybe the, the advocates of the big theories have kind of tended to try and explain everything rather than being happy with explaining one thing. If we could, I don't know, get attention, that was Crick's initial idea. Um, and uh, yeah, one of, one of the things that uh, surprised me um, was, was Crick, actually. So my, my previous book, which was about the genetic code, ended up being a kind of paean of praise to Francis Crick, which I didn't expect it to be at all. And I knew when I started off writing the book that yeah, Crick stopped, you know, left Cambridge, went to the Salk Institute, and he he tried to solve consciousness, ha ha ha, and you know that was it. But what was a, I was amazed by was in writing the second half of the book, the the, the present, uh, you know, from the 1950s onwards, was that with the exception of the chapter on chemistry, Crick kind of muscled his way to the front again, which I just was not expecting. I didn't know. I didn't know how significant he'd been in driving uh, the connectomes, for example. I had no idea. I didn't know he'd been in on the ground floor on the PDPs, these initial very, very smart uh, programs. I, it was complete mis news to me. Uh, and then to see quite how influential he'd been in consciousness, it, much more than my very crude <laughs> understanding, uh, was really very, very surprising. So I, I think that was probably the big thing that really kind of surprised me about the whole second half of the book, which I was not at all expecting to do. Um, yeah, so Gordon says, yes, the, the candy hearts were a bit like the phrases, English phrases on t-shirts. Yeah, absolutely. And it goes the other way. People are always getting tattoos of kind of Chinese or Japanese characters that are, <laughs> are inappropriate. Uh, so yeah, it's nearly there, but not quite. Uh, Jim wants to know what was my what I what would have been Castaneda's contribution to my book. Well, Carlos Castaneda for the, the younger people was very very fashionable in, in the seventies and eighties, uh, and he was an anthropologist in somewhere in California. I can't remember where, and he wrote this these books which were supposedly anthropological initially kind of anthropological studies of uh, how uh, yaki. Uh, who is just a particular indigenous people in New Mexico, their, their view of the world, and in particular their consumption of peyote, uh, because this was the 70s, after all. As I understand it, Castaneda's story kind of unraveled. His books got increasingly obviously fictional or novelized, um, and many people then suggested that maybe he hasn't really done all the research he claimed to have done. So there was a bit of a kind of odor of scandal surrounded him. But what I used it for initially, and uh, there were other accounts from uh, perhaps let's just say more bona fide uh, anthropologists who did go out and at peyote and you know, they were sat there in this hut and they're eating the peyote and they're disappearing into the, the tapestry on the wall and they become one with the, with the, the mystical animals. And so these are very uh, almost straight laced anthropologists who are getting high as a kite and having these very interesting uh, drug-based experiences which they were then describing back all this in the early 60s and what I was trying to get at in that and why it all got cut uh, and included stuff about Lascaux the, where the cave paintings are was it was part you know our ideas about what's real and the difference between humans and animals and this was a thread 
but it was a, a thread too many, so it got cut. Um, I think there is a reference to, there's a footnote to Castaneda. But if you want to know about kind of weird 70s science, because that ended up being a thread as well, partly because, um, I think I say this in the acknowledgements, I realized in writing the book, I was in fact digging up stuff that I'd learned about 40 years earlier. Or I, this was stuff I'd been thinking about for 40 years in different ways. Um, so uh, the scotophobin stuff, which was probably going to be news to many of the young people in the section on memory, this idea that protein could be memory, memory could be a, a thing you could, you know, an actual molecule you could hold. Uh, and that turned out to be a, a, a kind of collapse, uh, disappeared, it evaporated. Um, that was, you know, something that found its way in the book. But I remember in the, in the mid 70s, this was a hot topic because it had just been something we thought then had just kind of disappeared overnight. Um, so that was a lot of the things in the book are things that were put there by my teachers and I thank them because they all made me. Um, most of them are dead sadly, but some of them are still alive and I'm still in contact with them. Uh, and you know, they, they changed the way I thought about the world. What I learned uh, when I was 18, 19, 20 is, is still kind of the way I look at things now. Um, so yeah, there's some work on, uh, Alex Zhao has got uh, neuro annealing, which I don't think I know about, but I'm very wary about being uh, snotty, uh, in particular about consciousness, because I know so little about it. And the connectome specific, har mm, specific harmonic waves, says Alex. So there's some links in there you might want to follow up. Anything else? Anybody else going to say, come on, you must have thrown the book across the room at some point, somebody in rage. Are you all zoomed I'm, out? I, I'm I understand looking if you are. around. Well, I will say, I will say um, that some people felt you were um, a little uncharitable in your evaluation of uh, brain imaging. Yes, okay. Right, well, I mean, I, I did my best and I did, I pulled the rug from under my, my feet as well by saying, uh, look, the, um, you know, the, the, the reason why we can do this amazing stuff with the, the, the face centers of the brain that Doris uh, Tsao can do this amazing stuff and other people have been able to stimulate those areas of the brain. And I thought that French study I cited about somebody who's it wasn't just the face went all kind of blurry but that actually bits of Nicolas Sarkozy's face was stuck in, in the right place to in their perception um, and the only reason we know that is because that's where the fMRI stuff said it should be so uh, uh, yeah I mean I, I apologized <laughs> I apologize oh. to those who <laughs> those who work on I mean you know I I there are hundreds of thousands of papers on fMRI and I don't think they're all bunkum, uh, but <laughs> not all of them, one or two, maybe. Uh, but I think the key thing is it's, it's, it's this deceptiveness about it that, you know, where is not how is the, the kind of snappy quote that I, I used. But I, I think that's true. And it's, the same goes for connectomes. So many of my very cellular colleagues who are obsessed with connectomes, I mean, that applies to them as well. Um, just because you know where something is happening doesn't necessarily tell you a great deal about it. I mean, it could be very significant for saying, well, we mustn't take this bit out. We mustn't operate here because, mm -hmm. you know, something bad is going to happen. Um, but I think there is a, especially amongst the general public, there is an assumption that there's kind of a neophrenology uh, about fMRI and that we know something if we know where it is. Uh, yeah. and I, I think there's a problem with that as kind of an epistemological problem, which uh, the, I mean, I recognize as well, the field in particular has been extremely self-critical and, um, you know, the whole kind of replication crisis, which I think everybody who works on behavior, including me, should be very worried about. Uh, you know, it's got me thinking about papers I've published. Um, I did a, uh, I, I published a paper on dog handedness. So we, <laughs> Uh, this is a student project and we you know we worked on it on on whether dogs use their left or right paw or whatever uh 
and in the end we found a result how about that but you know i now think that it this was p hacking i think this was us trawling through and then eventually mm -hmm. we find the ex, you know the, the significant result okay and somebody recently contacted me and said could we have the raw data because they were wanting to do a meta analysis and i amazingly because this was all done about 15 years ago i still had the excel spreadsheet and i sent them the data and i said but you know i think this is rubbish i really don't believe it's true at all and a lot of that worry has i think come from the fmri community first because of the dead salmon business and then because of all the stats you know panics they've been so i think it's to the credit of the community that they've taken this seriously and have really then made everybody else everybody else should be taking this seriously because you know if you can't believe your own data then you've got a problem and certainly there are some of my i look back on my animal work and i uh, including on maggots and i think well yeah is that is that real you know yeah 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 i have a friend um, hal pashler who some of you may know who always says um when people read your work they they believe your theory but they are no they believe your data but they doubt your theory but when you're looking at your own work you doubt your data you believe your theory but you doubt your data anyway but i just i mean just to sort of close the loop on imaging um I mean, yes, it's, you know, the seductive allure, um, as uh, the phrase goes, also the statistical problems with imaging and lots of other fields. Cancer research apparently has a real problem with this. But also, I mean, we all, where, where can be a powerful heuristic for figuring out how, as you point out with uh, Doris Sow? Um, yep. But also, you know, there are additional techniques like um, adaptation designs where, you know, looking at what kinds of stimulus manipulations in repetition um, decrease or don't change the bold signal tells yeah. you something about what kind of information, you know, the neurons and those in that area are using. So, I mean, obviously no, no method is gonna get us all the way there, but I, I feel like, you know, imaging gets bashed sometimes because it is so, you know, it's like the pretty girl in middle school that everybody hates because <laughs> it's pretty. Uh, you know, I don't have this problem, but I never did. <laughs> But I mean, it's, you know, it's so cool and it's so well-funded and, you know, there, there's plenty of reasons. Well, it is all for, I mean, you, sadly, you've got the US version and uh, they're not on the line, but uh, basic are cheapskates and they wouldn't publish the, so the plates, the, the images in the UK version are in color and oh. they're in lovely shiny paper. So, you know, I, you saw the, 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 the but, uh, you know, the, the cover i remember when it came out i remember seeing it and being absolutely astonished uh, and it is a fantastic uh, image and so i tried to i tried to get over the excitement when the researchers were doing it because i you know clearly there are it is tremendously powerful uh, on the other hand uh, and there were you know kind of a couple of snotty tweets that i i'm afraid i included because I'm, I'm a terrible twitter addict and so when colleagues were you know, there's one about somebody saying he's never been in an fMRI meeting without thinking he was with a snake, uh, somebody selling snake oil. Um, and I, I think it's striking that there's this disconnect between different parts of the neuroscience community. Yeah. And it, it comes because, you know, it's, it's the same with the consciousness thing. You know, if you're interested in how se single cells function and represent the world and make the animal or the human move, then the you know, it's so broad, the, the, the lack of resolution uh, makes you just worry, that's all. But um, like I said, you know, we wouldn't have some of the fantastic insights we do without fMRI. And certainly if I, um, if I had a, a problem with my brain, I'd want an fMRI scan before they went poking around in there. <laughs> Fair enough. Let me see, we've got some other things here. Okay, so we've got, uh, so Stephen Morse, um, who is on the law faculty here, 
says, well, you can read it yourself and so can everybody else. Yeah. Um, uh, so the relevance of new neuroscience to other disciplines. Hmm. How ready is the science for prime time outside its domain? Well, I, I certainly wouldn't want uh, either, uh, you know, any scan. So there are claims that some scans, for example, can uh, tell whether you're lying. <laughs> and that would be very alarming, I think, because I don't think anybody would uh, accept that as being right. true. Um, and as far as I know, although there are companies that claim to do this, for example, in America, no court, I'm glad to say, uh, has yet accepted that you can, you know, stick a scan or any kind of, you know, lie detector we all know this is uh, the stuff of stuff of fiction where it serves a very important role but uh i think one issue that's not dealt with at all in the book uh much to the great irritation of a one of my good friends jerry coin uh, who's obsessed with free will i'm afraid i'm, I'm not <laughs> i'm even less interested in free will than i am in in uh, <laughs> consciousness uh, I, I mean, I, I recognize it being, as being a massive problem. The philosophers, uh, I have a, philosopher, a tame philosopher who read uh, the chapter on Locke, or the, which deals with Locke in the, in the kind of 18th century. And she's, uh, uh, you know, she, she's obsessed with free will. Um, and she said, why aren't you writing more about this? And I said, well, I'm not sure that the science at the level that I'm interested in has got the, has really got much purchase on it. You know, does a, does a maggot have free will? Because uh, that's, you know, that's, that's the level I work at. So do I have free will whether to decide to not do or something? Uh, I, I don't know, but I'm not even convinced that a maggot does. And I know that there's philosophical arguments about determinism and so on. Uh, I mean, if, if we don't have free will, then I think clearly the punitive, the legal system has got a lot to think about uh, in that punishing people would seem to be entirely inappropriate if they really could not have done different. That doesn't mean to say you let them wander around and kill each other or kill us. Uh, but that does mean to say that the, the, the reason why we take action in the courts and we restrict people's liberties will be very different. And um, that would, I don't think it's just, that would clearly be massive, not just for the courts, but for the whole of the world, if we were to accept that people simply behave the way they are for lots of determined reasons without any any free will but the striking thing of course is that's not what it feels like it does feel as though do i have a choice whether it's a choice to eat that extra piece of chocolate that i really shouldn't eat because it's not going to do me any good or you know should i go over the speed limit i'm talking about very minor misdemeanors um and it certainly feels like i had a choice not to put my foot on the accelerator but i decided i just want to get home early and so i went a little bit over the speed limit um, so I think that's part of the problem, but the, what's striking is that that relates even to where the mind is. And that's the kind of beginning of the book and in a way the end is that that's not, it doesn't feel like you're, up, <laughs> feels like you're in your heart or in your guts or elsewhere in your body. You don't feel, you know, I, I think that's entirely a, a kind of construct. Um, and that was that's partly why I wanted to explore the uh, the more anthropological side of it and something that didn't get really drawn out much in the book because it happened right at the end was the um, the fact that for Austra I, I was aware that I you know I'd covered uh, China I'd covered uh, the Americas lots of uh, anthropological evidence in the 19th century from the Americas north and south but then I thought well wait a minute what about the Australian Aborigine pe Aboriginal people, what do they think about where the mind mm. is? And I got this big uh, two volume kind of encyclopedia of Aboriginal ideas. And although the brain was mentioned in there, it was only in terms of kind of anatomy and not in terms of what they thought at all. It was just in the kind of explanation. And this wasn't very satisfying. The mind wasn't in there either. So mind and brain were nowhere in this encyclopedia. And eventually I managed to uh, contact an Aboriginal academic in Australia who was very kind enough to respond to me. And she said, well, you know, if you were to ask somebody, where is an Aboriginal person? Where is the, the mind? Is the mind in your head or is it in the heart? They wouldn't understand the question. It would have no meaning because mm. for them, spirit, mind, however you want to classify it, is not even contained in the body because they're connected with the land. And so it's this completely different way of conceptualizing. You're not even within yourself, but you are, you are part of the land. Um, 
Now, my guess is that's probably a very, very old ancestral view about what we are as, as beings. And my hunch, but I couldn't prove it, would be that if we could go back before, long, long before um, the development of uh, agriculture and civilizations, that that's the kind of thing that many people would have assumed. And this was partly what I was why I was getting into the Carlos Castaneda and taking, <laughs> taking uh, peyote. Okay, um, the basic, ah, I came that the basic suite of cognitive uh, capacities in humans are known to exist in uh, insects. And I give some examples, excitement, indecision, prediction, foresight, aggression, personality, and responding to pain. How far can the study of invertebrate brains extend to humans? They don't have language. No, I, yeah, oh, well, uh, certainly, the, I don't think a fly or a maggot has language, okay? <laughs> Let's be very clear about that. Um, and I don't think, well, I hope that they're not conscious in the same way as we are. I mean, I do think there are qualitative differences, don't, don't get me wrong. I just think that there are some things that we can use very, very simple systems to get at principles that may well be present in more complicated and interesting organisms like ourselves. I mean, I'm very interested in people. I'm not just interested in, <laughs> in small, uh, small brains. Yeah, they don't have language. And clearly that's one of the things you can't even study. You know, we all know about the work on, on uh, Washoe or the, um, the work on sign language in, in, in chimps. You know, Washoe, amazing animal, but she never taught her babies to speak. She never tried. Uh, you know, she could sign and she'd sign to her, the people who are working with her, the gardeners, but she never, you know, she did for 20 years, she had several babies. And I think that tells us something about the way that she was using language, whatever we might like to think of it as, it wasn't the same way as we do. And the fact that no other animal points, I mean, I think that's just extraordinary. You know, babies will point at whatever it is, eight months, something like that. No animal points. They might look, they'll show gay, you know, goats and stuff if one goat looks then they'll all look in the same direction is there a predator there or something but pointing you know, just think about it. it's just such an extraordinarily amazing thing partly because it requires a theory of mind you've got to imagine that the, the person you're, you're you're pointing for will not look at the end of your finger which is what cats and dogs do as <laughs> whenever i try and show something to my cat of course it just looks at my finger um it doesn't it can't conceive that there's something in my head and I'm trying to get that over. So yeah, I think there are some amazing uh, differences and that's, yeah, that's why we can do all this astonishing stuff. And uh, even if, you know, there's amazing cognition in crows, people often get very excited about crows. You say, well, they've been around for 30 million years, crows. And I guess they've been able to make tools to make tools, which is amazing. But what have they done? You know, people, people in the seventies got excited. John, John Lilly took acid and, communed with dolphins and all sorts of stuff and you know the dolphins you know i know they can say so long and thanks for all the fish i'm being slightly facetious but i think that's very important that you know we are qualitatively different in these respects what are we feeling abraham says what are we feeling uh, when we feel emotions in our chest and abdomen Ooh. very good I, I'm, I'm not sure well it's the physiology and we're going back to the, you know emotions which comes first is it the idea or the emotion driving the the feeling um, and these are theories of emotion that go back to the beginning of the, the last century. What was striking is there's that recent, those two studies which I cite, which are in PNAS from uh, the Finnish researchers, where they ask people, where do you feel fear, excitement, love? And virtually none of them were up here. They were all in their bodies. You know, that's where people, uh, it was a, quite a large study. And then they got these lovely heat maps showing that it's all down here. That's where we, we feel we are um so we're feeling the yeah it's the it's the hormones it's the it's the uh, the nervous system the autonomic nervous system we have no control over not most of us don't don't some hunting dogs point yes but of course they've been bred to do that so a dog is going to be very interested where something and darwin was very interested in this when the, there's something over there it sees you know you shoot the you shoot the bird it falls and the dog will then, it's got to restrain its desire to go and chase the thing. 
uh, because that's what it would normally do, and even more so if it's trying to be nice to you. But then it's got to restrain itself, and we've selected them so they will do the thing that we think is pointing. I think the dog is just absolutely <laughs> desperately excited and wants to get off, but it's producing that uh, that movement. So that's I think that's a, a bit of a red herring. It's us making something point uh, for us rather than the dog. I mean, the dog's just saying, I saw where it fell. Uh, let me go and catch it. <laughs> go and get it. I think we're done with the questions. You did say that people will be zoomed out, which I can quite understand. I mean, Zoom's a marvellous thing, but it's hell as well. Hell is lots of squares. <laughs> um, Rick says, what might the roadmap for for getting this information, the brains of uh, disinterested laypersons, the understanding of behavior and decision science is the path towards a mission. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I think, uh, what, yeah. I think part, so yeah, the stuff that people are really, really interested in is things like, could I have done any, any different? That's partly because we all have our own to use an old term, we have our own inner demons that we fight, fight with, which might be trivial about eating or drinking, so things that are driving too fast, uh, but might be much darker and more problematic. Um, so I think, yeah, toleration of other people, imagining other people being like ourselves, that's one of the big problems. This all sounds terribly hippy-dippy. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, that acceptance of others is partly what we have to go through anyway. Um, and other people's brilliance, but also their, their difficulties. I mean, just from living with other people. Um, I think uh, so that ordinary people can understand the complexity. Uh, part of the problem with the book, and it was not intended to have a down on any area, is that by continually referring to what we don't know, you can end up thinking, well, we're, we're, you know, what's the point of it all? Whereas, of course, we do have insights. We can do remarkable things. We can get amazing insights. I mean, there's a, this was just in, slipped in at the very end, these, these papers on mice where they're effectively almost, almost at knowing what a percept is in a mouse. And they've, you know, not just recreating memories that the mouse, things that the mouse never experienced, but, you know, recreating patterns of perception. So the mouse sees a, series of grids and it's trained to lick when it series a, sees a grid and then they using optogenetics they recreate that image in the mouse's brain and it starts licking which is as near as damn it i think to actually say well that was that pattern of activity just is that's all it is and we can do this in in, in humans in, in in fact so one of the things my day job is the sense of smell and there's a particular odor called androstenone, which uh, some people like me think is quite sweet. Uh, other people can't smell at all. Some people think it smells quite sexy. How are you doing? And then some people think it smells absolutely foul. Um, and the most graphic description I had was from a very genteel young lady who, and you have to put your fingers in your ears because it's gonna be a bit rude. Uh, she said it smells like sweaty ball sack. Now this, um, this, uh, I don't know how she knew that. This, this smell, this is the fascinating thing. This smell is detected just by one of our, one class of our odorant receptors. The only receptor that can detect that is this single class of cells. And the difference between us is a single, two, two amino acid changes between those who think it smells nice and those of us who think it smells disgusting. disgusting. Two amino acid changes, which in fact are two, just, just two base changes. So it's doing something to alter the conformation of the receptor, which in turn is in some way changing the activity of the neuron. Now, if this was in my maggots, I'd have an electrode in there straight away to say, well, what's the difference in the, the signal that's being sent to the brain? Sadly, because it's in people, I'm not allowed to do that, uh, which is why I work on maggots. Um, but that shows you that ultimately perception, everything is it, it's just neurons all the way down. And I think for the general public, that's, that's probably the most challenging thing because it doesn't feel that way. It does feel as though you're inside, but, and I don't know how that works, but it is, it's just neurons. That's all there is. Um, 
Sam, enjoy the book. Um, spent some time reading through quantum computer explanations for consciousness, and I helped him understand the limits of using metaphors. But they're very powerful as well. Don't throw them away just yet. Um, been learning a little about genetics. Been the amazing pro Martha's been made, made amazing progress in predicting behavioral traits and includes about how, why. What metaphors being invoked in understanding molecular genetics and psychology? Well, yeah, I haven't been following that too much in particular in psychology, but I mean, genetics is kind of stuck with the idea of code and things are encoded and they're represented in some way in, in DNA, which they are and aren't. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's a useful insight, but you've got to remember that. I mean, I think about this every spring because, you know, you watch the birds making their nests and somehow that nest, because each species has got its own nest, somehow that nest is represented in its neurons and ultimately in its DNA. And I have no, you know, I just that, and then I just kind of stop and go yeah. up at the, the birds because it is just so astonishing. Um, and I used an example of a, a wasp nest paper that I remember loving when I was an undergraduate or a postgraduate, just started my PhD. And I thought, this is amazing. You could actually see the sequence of what the wasp is looking for. You know, you can make a little flow diagram of it. How that works? Wow, no idea. Um, George, Jim says it sounds like George uh, North Foxes or North Fox, I'm not sure. World brain problem, which concept which will replace the mind brain problem. Well, maybe. Um, I, I tend to think that we are just in our heads uh, and that the old perception of us being linked with the land is true at a psychological level, but not a, at a. So that's what it. That's, that's what it feels like, as I say. Um, and all of us have that perception of going home and of the land, you know, I mean, it's not just you need to be out for your mental health, but places that you've grown up in, that, that feels right. But part of the, what science and psychology in particular tells us that just, you know, in, introspection isn't going to help you that much because it's going to fool you. You'll fool yourself. You'll end up, there are things that we perceive that, um, uh, like an illusion, you know, optical illusions. You can see the, the face and the, the vase and it flips both ways. Uh, those astonishing illusions where you've got the different squares of gray and they look completely different and you, you actually have to, you know, print them out and chop them to sh chop them up to see that, yes, it is exactly the same gray because no matter how much you know, your mind, your brain is driving you and your mind, the two together, driving you to think that they're different different shades of gray so I, I i am a despite my growing up in or you know becoming an adult in the 70s and having a lot of interest in in, in weird science that we were interested in then um i am a rotten old materialist at heart <laughs> i just think it's very complicated are we done well, I'm, think... I'm typing away here, but let me, let me just talk. It's easier. <laughs> my, my mouth goes faster than my fingers. Um, I, I have one question. Yeah. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a point to end on. Um, so your book makes, you know, this really compelling case that, you know, science uh, depends on metaphors. Certainly neuroscience has. And those metaphors have been enabling of good science as well as limiting. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, you, Matthew is an award-winning teacher, actually. I noticed that reading his website. What, what implications does this have for education? Can we, can we educate students to be more aware of the implicit metaphors and to not kind of mindlessly follow them to the end? In, in my experience, in general, people are, are very shocked and, and excited. I mean, I think it's genuinely liberating when you, I mean, the moment people are arguing, and I'm not sure I agree with them, whether there is even code, whether there is a neuronal code, whether a neuron 
as it fires more rapidly, as it you stimulate it more, is that a code? Is there an, you know, uh, is is that then wanting to be decoded by upstream downstream structures, as they call it, which is just this mm -hmm. kind of hand wavy, the stuff we haven't got to yet. I, I tend to think there is, but I think even thinking about that really make it, it pulls you back and makes you think about the, the the basic work you're doing. So that's something that I encourage my students to 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 think about. What what when we use those words, which I do in my in my papers, in my academic work using titles of article, plus it sounds sexy and sounds good, you know, code, that's exciting. And yeah, you know, <laughs> cracking the code you put in your grant, you know, and they say, oh yes, that's gonna be, because it's, but I think thinking about whether there really is such a thing and gets you to the very basis of what you're trying to study. And you may end up saying, okay, well, I'm still not sure really what it is, but it, it suffices at the moment to use this as a heuristic, as a, as a tool for discovery that the, I'm gonna think about there being a neuronal code or um, uh, yeah, about the brain operating like a computer. I mean, people got, uh, people got very cross about that, partly because, you know, kind of distorted views and there's a bit of, tweeting. is it a computer or isn't it a computer? And nobody actually thinks it's a computer. They just think that it carries out computations. Um, but then I, I remember, I asked somebody on Twitter, I said, can anybody give me a really good example where we know the neuronal basis of these computations in a brain? and people were much less confident. So I think, yes, the brain is carrying out computations, but there's the way in which that is kind of taking us down a, a way of thinking about what's going on, about, you know, brains in vats and sitting there bobbing around, you know, which is what a lot of people think, you know, and there's, uh, there's that article that I cite that the, the brain has a body, you know, shock horror. <laughs> But, but so many people forget that, that it is, in, you know, we are connected and it, it, it's all part of the, we need to understand things in that context. So I think by what it can do is just by kind of poking students and making them think about that and see how the same concept has altered over time. That can, it may not lead to any great theoretical insight, perhaps, um, maybe someday it will and somebody will go, yeah, okay, that's what we're going to need to change the way we think but at the very least it makes you think about your data ultimately in a different way and the concepts you're being taught and in the classroom makes them should make them question what you're saying because one of the uses of metaphor is to get over the difficult bits <laughs> so you know students realize when they come to university that they've been lied to and this is particularly the case in physics you know, where it's just so horrendously complicated, you could not explain it. And probably, I guess, in physics, you only really get told the truth when you're doing your PhD, because it's all got to be approximations. And there's a lot of that, I think, in areas of biology as well, that just by occasionally kind of pushing at it and say, well, you know, just remember, genetic information is not real. It's our way of interpreting it. And you can't calculate the informational content of a genome that people try to they're generally mathematicians and computational people who don't understand biology right economists they're into that yeah yeah yeah, so, yeah, yeah 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 okay all right um i, I the 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 scroll of questions um has finished i think we're done come to a end yeah and we've, we're down to 24, so well done you for... <laughs> well done you for holding 24 people <laughs> in the late afternoon on... Uh, thank you, thank you so much. And we can't really give you a round of applause unless... Uh, what happens if everybody unmutes and claps? Okay. Let's see. Should we, should we try that and see what the, what the sound works. effect is? Oh, you can is? clap with your hands. You can clap either really or thank you. And thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your questions um, and for your, your comments and for your attention because, yeah, you stuck it out. Yeah, thank, thank the you. End of a Zoom so full day. <laughs> <laughs> many, many thanks. Thank you. Okay, so that's, been, that's been great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, let's see. Ooh. Uh, Okay. Yes, thanks everybody for coming and thank you again, Matthew.
Okay, well, thank you for having me. And yeah, I really meant it. It was, uh, it's, I, I am overwhelmed by how <laughs> you've been reading it and thinking about it and using it as a springboard for argument and discussion. People are going to use it for their students. I could not have wished for anything more. It's been brilliant. Fantastic.